Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. We all know there are many myths of lost sunken continents, islands and cities around the world. From Plato's story of Atlantis, to the Indian Dwarka, Mu and High Brazil, and I think for many of us, it's a subject that really does excite the imagination. In this video, I'm going to discuss something far less well known than Plato's Atlantis, so much so that I hadn't even heard of it until just recently. I was scrolling through Facebook and saw an advertisement selling a folklore and history map of the British Isles, and there was a label on the map for the Welsh Atlantis, the name of which is Cantre Gwilad. Apologies to Wales if I've just butchered that, but it means the Lowland Hundred in English. Welsh legends say that this is a lost kingdom, which occupied a tract of fertile land between Ramsey Island and Bardsey Island in what is now Cardigan Bay to the west of Wales. It is therefore called the Welsh Atlantis, and it has featured heavily in local folklore, literature and song. Accounts do vary, and some say the land extended from Bardsey Island to Cardigan, or as far south as Ramsey Island. Today, the sea floor gets gradually deeper the further west from Wales you go, with the land below the sea immediately south of Bardsey Island being around 50 metres in depth, but in the centre of the bay, it is only around 24 metres in depth. If we compare this to Dogger Bank under the North Sea to the east of Britain, the highest point of the lost Doggerland landmass, this is also around 25 metres below sea level, and it is thought to have been poking through the North Sea as recent as 5,000 years ago. Therefore, maybe we shouldn't dismiss the idea of a lost sunken Welsh landmass in human history, without exploring this idea further. Some legends suggest that Cantre Gwilad extended some 20 miles west of the current Welsh shoreline into Cardigan Bay. And interestingly, the maximum depth of the sea 20 miles out is also around 25 metres. Some legends call the lost land Maes Gwydno, meaning the land of Gwydno, talking of a land that was drowned when the priestess of a fairy well allowed the water to overflow. But away from the more supernatural ideas, other accounts say that the land was ruled as part of the kingdom of Mirionid, by King Gwydno Garanhir, or Gwydno Aplidno who was apparently born in 520 AD. Legend says that this land was extremely fertile, so much so that any acre was worth four acres elsewhere. The catch was that this land depended on a dike to protect it from the sea. This dike had sluice gates that were opened at low tide to drain the water from the land, and they were then closed as the tide returned. Legends say that around 600 AD, one night a storm blew up from the southwest, driving the spring tide against the sea walls. The appointed watchman was named Sethanin, who was known for being a heavy drinker, and at the time, he was attending a party near Aberystwyth. Some accounts say he fell asleep due to too much wine, or was having too much fun to notice the storm, but either way he forgot to shut the sluice gates. Inevitably, the sea rushed in, flooding the land and drowning 16 villages. The king and some of his court apparently escaped by running to safety along San Symphalin, which is a very real feature of the landscape and is known as a shingle spit, looking like a man-made causeway that runs out into the sea. The legend has inspired many songs and poems and is thought to have been first mentioned in the 750-year-old Black Book of Carmarthen. This book was written in 1250 AD and contains poems and much older material relating to events that have taken place over the centuries, including a poem of the lost sunken landmass. This book does tell a different story of the Welsh Great Flood. It says that Sethanin was actually a visiting local king, who at the time of the storm was intent on amorously distracting the fair maiden Merarid, who was apparently in charge of the sluice gates. He was successful in his efforts and the land was flooded. Apparently, if you're in Aberdiffy in Wales, folklore says you can still hear the bells of the lost city on a quiet Sunday morning. This is also said to be the nearest place on dry land to the sunken city. The Bells of a Diffie was a popular song in the 18th century and is apparently still sang in Welsh pubs today, 
and it all relates to the legend of the Welsh Atlantis. So, there are the myths and legends, but is there any real substance behind it? Did the Welsh people see features like San Sinfalin and other geographical phenomena in Cardigan Bay and write fanciful tales for the sake of poetry and storytelling? Or could there really be a real sunken landmass? Those that do believe the legend think it covers much of the lowlands beneath Cardigan Bay, and there are some geographical features that people do draw upon. There are features known as Sarnau, a series of single ridges several miles long which run at roughly right angles to the coast, and are located between each of the four rivers in the north of the bay. People believe that these could be the remains of causeways built to give access to the present mainland at high tide. In reality, they are likely just glacial moraines, natural formations of gravel, clay, sand and boulders, deposited at the end of the last ice age. Interestingly though, in 1770, Welsh antiquarian scholar William Owen Pugh reported seeing sunken human habitations about four miles off the coast of Wales. Writing in 1833, Samuel Lewis said that a collection of large stones and boulders could be seen, almost seven miles out to sea, west of Aberystwyth during low tides. He said they are thought to be the remains of a fort or palace. The idea that Cardigan Bay was once a plain of fertile land, protected by sluice gates as recent as 600 AD, is very likely a work of fiction. The identity of King Gwydno is debated by scholars, and some think he is merely a mythical king. But I don't think we should be quick to dismiss it, because even if it is a work of fiction, the story could well be based on much older myths, legends and oral traditions, maybe going all the way back to the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age times. As we've seen with the disappearance of Doggerland, sea levels have risen and land has sank, all of which happened relatively recently in history. And let's not forget a discovery only last year when Storm Francis uncovered tree stumps of an ancient forest 13 miles south of Borth in Wales. Storms in 2010, 2014 and 2019 also revealed tree stumps. There is now an astonishing number of petrified trees documented all along the coast of Wales, and these trees apparently only died between 4,500 and 6,000 years ago, and this was because of an inundation. There are birch, oak, hazel, willow and pine trees. The trees are rooted in peat, which lies below marine sand. Also found were the remains of animals such as Eurooks, red deer and brown bears. In addition to this, archaeologists have also discovered a timber walkway made of branches and posts. It was dated from just 3,100 to 4,000 years ago, clearly built to help people traverse the waterlogged ground, ground which may well have been very fertile. We have to remember, if this coastal area was a forest as recent as 2,500 BC, as scientific findings show, then it is likely that the actual prehistoric coastline was even further out in Cardigan Bay at this time, and also humans would have been here. Britain had a thriving Neolithic community way before this time, and the Mesolithic cultures of Britain go even further back. As stated, archaeology also shows humans were constructing timber walkways to get across these wetlands as recent as 2000 to 1100 BC during the Bronze Age. Since the end of the last Ice Age, there has been a gradual rise in sea level, but maybe there was a localised event that was more cataclysmic. Or maybe the Neolithic people did construct a large dike to cordon off this clearly fertile land, and it was fertile because we can see the abundance of vegetation and animals. Don't forget, Neolithic Britons were no stranger to large construction projects. Maybe it was overcoming a storm, or a geological fault created an earthquake and tsunami, and this washed away a number of ancient settlements. The Welsh Atlantis could well be a folk memory of the loss of this land, an oral tradition that was passed down from generation to generation, based on fact but embellished into fiction, and then woven into history over time. 
Alternatively, maybe poets and writers of old simply saw the remains of a forest on the Welsh beaches and wrote works of fiction based on what they saw. But we have to also consider the possibility that maybe the features called Sarnau, the causeways and ridges are in fact man-made. Maybe the eyewitness account from 1770 is true, and maybe Samuel Lewis did see the remains of a palace or a fort in the early 1800s. Yes, this is a lot of ifs, buts and maybes, but in Britain, we know for a fact there is a sunken landmass to the east in Doggerland. But now we know there is also one to the west called Cantre Gwilad, the latter only becoming waterlogged at the beginning of the Bronze Age. It's possible that Cardigan Bay still holds many secrets of Britain's past, and I think that this is one sunken landmass that is certainly worthy of further exploration. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.